today's lesson, automotive air conditioning. Let's choose this Subaru as a prime example of how stuff works. Man, it's so hot today, it's 31 degrees Celsius. I could use some air conditioning. Well, it all starts with the compressor. That thing right there. Every car compressor has a clutch, you know, that thing. The outside of the clutch that the belt runs on freewheels all the time, even when the air conditioning's not on. The part that drives the shaft inside the compressor is this drive plate. Power is sent to this wire. The electromagnets turn on. And this drive plate is sucked into the flywheel on this constantly turning pulley and drives all the mechanism inside the compressor. It works just like a fridge compressor or an air conditioning compressor in your window unit. Now somewhere on the low side tubing that is on your air conditioning system, there's usually a switch. Sometimes the switch is even on the compressor. What that switch does is when the air conditioning gas gets too low, which is called Freon, the switch shuts off and the clutch cannot operate. Sometimes when there's a leak in the system, the oil that's inside that compressor, which is a little bit flowing through all the pipes at the same time as the air conditioning system is working, is leaking out along with the Freon. Then if the system continued to function with no gas, it may have leaked out all the oil at the same time, and then you seize up your compressor, and they are very expensive, and on many cars, they are in a godforsaken spot way down there, or there, where you dread trying to take them out. Well, every car works pretty much the same. Same as a window air conditioner or essential air. You have the high side pipe, which goes out to the condenser coil, which is another radiator in front of your you know, your engine cooling radiator. Usually somewhere on the other side, there's a tube coming out. And it goes to the dashboard, where there's another radiator called the evaporator. Also coming from the dashboard and out of the firewall is that large pipe I just showed you, which is the low pressure pipe, where the compressor sucks the gas back in again to be recompressed and come out the high pressure pipe. And this car, the high pressure pipe, runs along this fender. It goes to a aluminum bottle, you know, it's probably about eight inches long. And that's called the receiver, dryer, or collector bottle. It has a filter in it and some powdered chemicals that absorb any possibility of moisture in the air, you know, like water or something. And also filters the Freon because as compressors wear out, Little gray bits and particles of metal end up in the system. Older cars, older than 1992, used to run all R12 Freon gas. Well, that burns my ass on hot days when that stuff gets up in the sky and ruins the ozone and we get more rays. So, the hot compressed gas comes out, goes into the condensing coil, which we can't see, but just looks like aluminum radiator exit here as it's cooled to air temperature and on front-wheel drive vehicles we have one or two electric bands that turn on to move air across there when the car is not moving so your air conditioning system doesn't overheat when your air conditioning system does overheat it usually stalls the clutch out and it starts making screeching noises or the belt slips on General Motors cars this tube that's exiting the front condensing coil has a little filter sock made of stainless steel somewhere inside. It looks like a woven mesh. That thing sometimes gets clogged and you wonder why well, your system's fully charged and you're not getting air conditioning. Also on General Motors cars and several other cars, inside that tube that's exiting the condenser going to the firewall is a one-way valve. Well, kind of like a one-way valve. It's shaped like this and as the gas passes through that space that I'm showing between my fingers, the pressure pushes the valve open. And the valve is sort of spring-loaded. So on these cars, even when they're low on Freon or have the right amount of Freon, if you test the pressure on the nipple, just if you're charging the system or checking it, it's always showing the right pressure unless it's just about has no gas at all. Because this valve opens and adjusts itself by the rate of flow, depending on how fast 
your compressor turning or, or engine RPM you have. Many cars don't have that system. They just have a TX valve or something like that as I explained in the earlier video. Well, the most common problem with car air conditioning is Freon leaks. One place where they don't leak that often but do sometimes is the seal in behind the clutch. You'll see a big wet spot underneath the bottom of your compressor and sometimes black all the way around here. Another place where they leak on the compressor is the compressor body. Some bodies are made in two halves bolted together, some are three pieces bolted together. And in between the aluminum housings is big O-rings. Well, on compressors that are near the bottom, like many cars, they get a lot of road spray, spray from water and salt debris and stuff like that. And corrosion gets between these tiny spaces between the compressor housings, eats around the O-rings, and even the compressor housing leaks. On Fords, they often have, wherever there's a joint, a quick connect connection and O-rings in there. And as the O-rings get old and tired, you get leaks around all the joints at the same time. That sucks. On very many Chrysler products from 1992 and throughout the rest of the 90s, inside your firewall under your dashboard where the evaporator is, you have the most serious leak of all, the hardest to fix one. That's your evaporator goes bad. This is a chronic problem with those cars, and especially some GM cars too. It can take seven to nine hours to rip out the whole dashboard steering column and wiring harness just to change one part. When you get a leak on the front condensing radiator, if it was a slow one, sometimes you can see it. You will see like oily, black, dusty grease spots. If you see any of those, change your condensing radiator, unless it's just got undercoating spray on it or something. When you want to recharge your car air conditioning, you're supposed to fix the leak first because it's just like a tire. Once it's got a hole, it doesn't get better, it gets worse. So if you don't fix the hole, it's all going to leak out again, so you've wasted your expensive gas and possibly damaged our ozone. But when you do get to the point of repaired leaks, you find the nipple on the largest tube, the low pressure tube. You screw your charging valve fitting from their low pressure gauge to it. Now if you know what kind of gas is in there and it's not completely empty so there still is some pressure, you can just add more. Always hook the pressure bottle or Freon bottle up to the middle port on your charging manifold. Make sure your manifold is not set by any moving parts. You don't want it to get eaten when you start your car. Now, the proper way to do this on a front-wheel drive car on a warm day is to run a garden hose on the condensing radiator in through the grill. That keeps uh, cold water running on it because front-wheel drive cars just aren't that great at getting a lot of air over their condensing radiator while the car is idling. So you won't get the correct charge. It changes the pressure. If your air conditioning system starts to overheat while being charged, then the pressure in the low side goes up too and you will incorrectly charge it. So if you don't have one of those variable vein valves in your output system, and I mean your exit tube, then of course you would charge it up to about 30 to 40 psi while running at about 1500 to 2000 rpm with the garden hose on there. If you rev your engine up, it's not uncommon for it to drop down anywhere from 17 to say 23 psi. That's normal. If you let it idle at, you know, 7 800 rpm, it's not uncommon for it to jump up to 45 psi. That's all normal, except for the cars with the valve in there. They always seem to run at the same pressure. Now, if you don't have your handy dandy set of manifold gauges, you can always redneck charge something just with the hose. That's it. Nothing else, and you can get a perfect charge that way, so long as you still have your garden hose on there. What you do is just screw the hose on, start adding Freon while you're running at about 12 to 1500 RPM. Hose running, and you hold your hand on the exit tube coming from the firewall, the large diameter one. As soon as it gets really cold, Stop right away. That means you've got enough Freon. That means there's enough Freon to cool the complete radiator that's inside the dashboard and have a little bit left over to come out the exit tube and back to the compressor. Then you know you're done. So if you bought one of those handy dandy little bottles from the automotive store that could have who knows what kind of gas in it, you don't have charging gauges, well, 
that's how you know you haven't overcharged it or undercharged it so do it that way it will always work now there's a couple different ways to test for leaks on any kind of air conditioning system this is called an electronic leak detector it's ticking right now it works like a Geiger counter it starts to tick faster when you get near a leak I'll turn the sensitivity adjustment to show you oops that's pretty fast Well, anyways, you get an idea of the sound it will make if you happen to touch a part of the pipe that's leaking. But watch out if the pipe has water vapor on it or any kind of liquid. The liquid can often set this beeper off too and give you a false reading. Or if you push it right against a flat surface and block all of the air, it will give you a false reading too. Unfortunately, sometimes you got to take this little probe around every square inch of surface of pipes radiators, compressor, just to find the stupid leak. And that still won't find the leak if it's under the dash. The other more common method today is a fluorescent dye. It's often green or pink colored. They pump it into the low pressure system, pressurize the system, run the system for a while, shut it down, give it a bit of time to leak, and then they shine an ultraviolet light on every surface area of every tube and part on the system and look for what glows. That's actually the best system. It's pretty effective. I like it. Ubru, if you had to repair it, is an easy to repair system. All the tubes are high up, lots of space, but that's not true for most cars. Most cars, they charge you an arm and a leg because the tubes are so difficult to, to replace when they leak and salt eats aluminum and of course in Canada we get lots of salt in the roads so the system gets eaten out during the winter time. And it's very common when you take one pipe apart that the fitting is welded together to the other pipe and both pipes have to re be repaired because the fitting breaks. If you notice when your car is idling and the air conditioning is on and it's constantly rapidly clicking the compressor uh, clutch on then off, on then off. That's telling you you got low Freon. Of course, if it doesn't click on at all, it's telling you either it's electrical malfunction, a bad clutch, or no Freon at all. It is normal once the system gets the inside of the car fully cooled and the system is working really well for the compressor to cycle off for little bits of time just because it doesn't want to run it over capacity. Nowadays, there's so many different gases you can put in your car to make it all better or sort of better, depending on how you fixed it. There's the uh, old R12, which you can smuggle in from Mexico and go to jail for. The one kind of gas you can never reuse in a car is R22 from a window air conditioner. Its pressure is so high that it'll just stall your compressor out and the system won't function. Even propane will work, believe it or not, but if you get in an accident, you might get a big fireball. There's R403, R134A, that's the best one. And there's a whole bunch of other ones with funky names and product names and patents that you can buy nowadays at your automotive store cheap for rednecks who don't want to get a professional job done. Now, the last important piece of information is if you did replace a part of your air conditioning system or there was no gas in it when you went to recharge it, it's got air in the pipes. Automatically it has air in the pipes and your system will function horribly if you don't get the air out of the pipes. It might even ruin your compressor. And air contains moisture and that's very bad for a system. There are things called vacuum pumps. I just don't have one in front of me right now. But what it does is it, you can hook it on to this line, your gauge set, open all the gauges, shut off the bottle, and vacuum all the air out of your system once all the leaks are fixed. Then, when this thing's done vacuuming for 10 minutes to an hour, who knows? The longer the system's been open, the longer you want to vacuum it, because the more chance there's moisture in there. Once it's done being vacuumed, shut your machine off on, that's on the ground. Shut all your valves off. Turn your bottle back on. Then start the car up and do the charging process. If you want to add more oil to your compressor, vacuum out the system as I just explained. Then unhook this tube pinch it off with a vice grip, stick this end into your container of oil, unpinch the vice grip, and the vacuum in the system will suck the oil into the system and lubricate the compressor in case your compressor leaked, or, or the oil leaked out of one of the pipes. 
Compressors don't take a whole lot of oil, anywhere from like three to six ounces, so don't overcharge them or you'll stall them out and bust the pistons or veins inside and ruin your compressor. So, now you know how it works, you know how to fix it. Well, if you know where to get some gas from, you have a few tools, now you know how to fix your car and make it work perfect.